Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Arts and the School of Culture and Society, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here. I am Anne-Marie Perhus. I'm Vice Dean for Research and I'm also a philosopher. So I want to welcome you all to today's lecture by Professor Hartmut Rosa, who is Professor in General and Theoretical Sociology at the Friedrich Schiller Universität in Jena and also in charge of the Advanced Institute uh, at, uh, at Jena. We have had the privilege of welcoming Hartmut Barossa several times here in Aarhus. Uh, we just talked about you were here once in the Business and Social Sciences Department in 2013, but I also know that uh, the publication uh, Alienation Ac Acceleration was actually it was published in, at Aarhus Universitätsfolie in 2010, so even before that. Yes. So um, through Professor Rosa's insights, we are compelled to recognize the profound impact of modern society and capitalism on our lives. Rosa's comprehensive understanding of the dynamics surrounding modern subjectivity draws inspiration from a synthesis of critical thought, existentialism, and hermeneutics. The insightful and sensitive nuances in his understanding of our modern lives is something many of us draw on in our work, our own work across all the disciplines um, at the university and outside the university. So among the audience today, I know that not only the PhD students that uh, you have just talked to and met with earlier today, they are here, Present is also many of our leading theologians, psychologists, philosophers, anthropologists, sociologists, journalists, and many more. Here present is also the people who have translated your work, introduced it to a Danish audience, and many, many readers of your work are here. Readers of the work on acceleration, also to the very rich book on resonance from 2016, the books on Unverfügbarkeit, on why democracy needs religion, and also your work on ped pedagogy. I also want to share with you, the public, some of the emailing with Hartmut Rosa <laughs> before today, because I asked you uh, whether you were open to the idea of going back to the love and sympathy, the draht uh, between people you talked about in an interview with, a few years ago. and. Um, and in that interview, you were asked about the relationship between resonance and love, and whether. Uh, and I also asked you whether you 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 would accept my invitation to talk about the philosophy of love, friendship, parental love. We talked about Nächstenliebe and also the erotic love, and of course sympathy. I also mentioned to you, and I'm maybe I I am not the first Dane to mention that to you, but I also mentioned to you that I found some similarities between your thinking and the thinking of the Danish uh, philosopher and theologian Koe Lugstrup and his De Ethische Forderung. So I, tat, I attached a text from the uh, German Zeitschrift uh, für Theologie und Kirche from 1955, which was integrated later on, actually on, only a year later, in the Ethical Demand as Chapter 7. So I also admit to you that there was, I, I did say that in this chapter there were some quite weitreichende or religious or metaphysical um, ideas in that text, but I also told you that there were some quite interesting phenomenological views on love and on loneliness and human it's a dependency. You accepted to include Lugstrup and I'm very grateful you did. So I also promised you back then that there would be, I would find some very good discussions. I found two, very good. Um, professor in Anthropology, Lloyd Meinert, and Professor in Philosophy, Thomas Schwarz. So you will talk today about the, your contributions to sociology and maybe touch upon the concept of future even, because it's called a future lecture, I don't know. Um, it's a series of, of uh, lectures where some of, I think, some of the people you also draw upon, Bruno Latour, Karen Barad, um, Martha Nussbaum, um, have been here before you. So um, you will talk about love, friendship, and sympathy, and even connecting it to Lusto. And thank you and so much for, um, 
I thank you so much for being here, and I really look forward to to your uh, lecture. Welcome. Right. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. The powers for this very kind uh, introduction, and to you, and to the dean, and the department, and the school, and the university for inviting me again. I I have a bit I have a bit mixed feelings because I think it's the sixth the, the sixth time I'm now in Aarhus, and last uh, yesterday when I arrived, I I thought I I was in a hotel I had not been before, and I thought, well, let's see what I can find my way round, and I actually could. So I was really proud. It feels a bit like coming home, right? So I really like Aarhus, uh, but uh, so that's the good part. But the other is that I'm a little scared and nervous because on the one hand, there are so many people here, right? I think I could never live up to all the expectations. And on the other hand, as you just mentioned, Barat and uh, Latour and all these people. So I'm a little scared, right? <laughs> but I will do my very best. The other part why I'm scared is because I have to deal with all of this, right? With love and with friendship and with Röstrup and with resonance and <laughs> with the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I only had 40 minutes, <laughs> but since I'm an expert on acceleration, I think we will can. <laughs> I hope we can uh, we can deal with this, right? So the idea is uh, actually I want to um, uh, to uh, uh, to move in five st uh, in five. It's five or six. I forgot <laughs> steps uh, to, uh, together with you, right? I want to uh, t very briefly outline what I what I tried to do overall. I call it the soci sociology and the sociology der Weltbeziehungen. We just talked about it in the masterclass. It's very hard to translate it adequately into English, right? The sociology of self-world relations, you, you could say, or our relationship to the world. Then I will briefly present the resonance conception. Which, which is at the core of how I would think about love and friendship. And then I will really focus on love and friendship as two specific forms of relationship, right? Which I think, of course, the, the, they are really, the, the, they are essentially forms of resonant relationships. At least we think of them and we try to live them as forms of resonance. And then I would, I, I think, I try to think uh, first about the differences between the two and then about uh, solidarity as one other form, which I think has to do with the Lustrup, uh, the ethical demand. I think he says, if I read him correctly, I found it very interesting indeed right, to, to think about him, uh, that the ethical demand only becomes kind of relevant when natural love fades or fails, right? So if, if I am in love with someone, then actually you don't need an ethical demand. But what if someone is in trouble or asks something of me whom I don't love, right? Whom I rather don't want to have, right? This is when society needs a form of solidarity, for example, and we need it in social groups and in society at all. So what about that? I will uh, try to think about it and then uh, finish with a few considerations of forgiveness, which uh, is very interesting for, for what I try to do. And uh, for example, for Kierkegaard, of course, also. So let's start. I mean, I think I want to do a sociology which really starts from uh, from the question of how, uh, of relationship. Well, it's already something Lustrup would uh, would uh, would uh, share, right? I think we have to understand that human beings are not just by their nature related to each other and to the world, or maybe by our nature we are related to each other and to the world. But the way we enter into contact, we 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 form relationships. That always depends on. Um, uh, on on social conditions and uh, and society, you could say. Nevertheless, I think we could start with uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, for example. It's clearly a phenomenological approach, right? He says, I find this very convincing, right? He says the first moment of consciousness, of awareness, either of a baby or when you wake up in the morning or when you were unconscious, right? There is a. It's really interesting when you wake up or someone wakes you up in the middle of the night. Um, th then there is an awareness, something is there, something is present, right? The presence is the first uh, moment, right? And this presence, the sense of something is here, go goes before self-awareness. Oh, it's me, right? You might actually have forgotten who you are, right? You know, these rare moments where you don't really quite know who, who, who you are and what the world is, right? And then it only develops the, 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 the separation between the subject and the object, the me and the world is already kind of a second step, right? So the first question is, uh, something is present. One could say this is the, the first gift moment Löstrup talks about. And now the interesting question for the sociologist is about the nature of this presence and the nature of this uh, relationship, right? I think this is clearly socially formed, right? Whether the world which you encounter is threatening or dangerous or indifferent and cold or 
and tissing and calling or so. That depends on social context, on prior experiences and so on. But what is important is that I would really claim, and I think with Louis Truppert, that the relationship, you could say the entanglement or the interwovenness comes before being a subject and an object. So when I talk about self-world relations, it's not that I think there is a self here and there's the world there, and now let's see how the two interconnect. But the two are always, always already kind of interpenetrated and interwoven, and, and it's out of the nature of connection that we develop a self and that the world takes shape outside, right? And this, and then, uh, you know, Charles Taylor, the great um, uh, Canadian philosopher, has a strong influence on me, right? And he, he would say we are interpretation all the way down. And I, I think what he means is that the the this it, the relationship between us and the world is not given. It's not not at least not just biological, but it's interpretation. And we it, and it's uh, it, it, so what so what I am as a subject and what the world is depends on processes, individual and collective processes of. Uh, interpretation and therefore it's not starting with a subject object dualism in the Descartian sense right I'm not claiming there's the subject here and the, uh, the object there there are many forms of interpenetration and what can be can become a subject or an object forms out of this and I think our experience to the uh, our being in the world has these two sides which we can distinguish namely an active side right I'm you wake up in the morning and there's a world and this has an, an and then you either you want to or you have to explore it to move into it to see what's there or to get work done or so so it has an active side you uh, you approach the world but the world also approaches you you experience it right and it's quite interesting in sociology you can actually distinguish two kinds of people right so one kind of one one sort of people one one type starts really with the with the with the with the active part I want to see the world. I want to explore the world, right? I want to move in the world, right? So the idea is I move, the world is there. But others have the other experience, right? They would say, you never know what the world has in store for you, right? What the world does to you. So so, so the dynamics c can start on either side, but it's always a kind of dynamic, um, active and passive interpretation of self and world. And what I'm looking for really right now, I think that's a part of the problem we have as a society that we can think of this relationship to life, to the world, only in either I do something, I'm active, I'm the doer, or I am the done to, the victim, something is done to me, I throw, or I am thrown. We think really of life, even of social life, of, of the world, always along these lines, either I do something or something is done to me, while processes of life, particularly in society also, very often you cannot really clearly say who is active and who is passive. It's the in-between. It's being partly active, partly passive, like in a dialogue or in a conversation in such a group, right? Sometimes you cannot say it's my idea or it's your idea. The idea comes out of the in-between, right? It's kind of circulating social energy. That's what I want to work on next. And we could actually call this medio passive. It comes from linguistics, right? It's half active. It's not just half passive. It's also half active. It's ha ha having having participating in a world. So this is where I want to get it. And the world, of course, can be the world of things, of objects, the social world of other people, and the subjective world. What I what I the experiences I have with myself. Now we are already at the second. No, it's the no, no, it's the no, it's still the first step. Yeah, I, yesterday I changed it and I decided that this is still the first step, right? <laughs> what is the main relationship we develop in our society? That's the question the sociologists would ask, right? And in order to understand this, I, I use for quite some time, you find it in the acceleration book. No, you find the idea in the acceleration book, but the term you find in the resonance book. We live in a society which is operates in a mode of dynamic stabilization, which means don't have the time to explore it at length, but it means that we permanently need to achieve growth, economic growth. You know, the Danish government always wants growth. The German government wants growth. The EU wants growth. The Americans, the Chinese, the everyone, right? We need to grow, not because people are hungry in Denmark or don't have enough clothes or don't have enough cars or don't have enough houses or so, but because otherwise you cannot maintain the system in the sense of the jobs, the healthcare system, the universities, the pension schemes, and so on. Of course, you also have people who are hungry and don't have homes, 
but actually economic growth is not really for them because they can't afford to buy all these things, right? So we have to grow exactly in those segments at elements where we already have too much, particularly too much for the environment. So this is my kind of critical diagnosis of present society. It has, a, of course, it has to do with the logic of capital circulation, money, commodity, money, prime, which means economic activity is only done. Money is invested. For example, you open a shop, let's say McDonald's invests money or whoever it might be, right? Um, in, 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 with the hope that they could get more money out of it, right? You invest something with the hope to make more money. So the whole logic of capital investment of economic activity follows this logic, investing something in order to get a prime, a rent, a profit, some form of earnings, however you, a, su a surplus value, however you do it, it then you, we would have to go into econo economics, which we don't do here. But the, but the logic is that the system only, that's the definition here, stabilizes itself society can only stay as it is stay as it is means keep our institutions if we permanently accelerate innovate and uh, grow now that means if for example you think that life is stressful right now i could really predict that next year it will be more stressful right it's a kind of it, this is a kind of necessity it's been going on for 250 years right there will never be there's there's no limit to it it's never enough right we, we all the technologies are kind of accelerating life, communication, transport, and so on. And if you ask when is it enough, or if, if you think of economic growth, when do we when do we produce enough? Then economists will tell you never. We always need to grow. Okay, so that's the logic of our so social system, right? So it leads to technological acceleration, the acceleration of social change, and the acceleration of the pace of life, right? You could really say it has an escalatory logic. And you see the consequences of the es this escalatory logic um, everywhere there are also there is also talk about the, the great acceleration in the 20th century, right? Where you really see the use of resources and energy consumption and coal consumption and all of these things go up all the time, but also the the pollution and the emissions and so on, right? So it's a kind of escalatory tendency of um, of our um, society. But this is the structural side, and it's connected to what I call the cultural side, right? We as the selves. It's about self-world relations. I now told you something about my analysis of the of the structural side, right, of the institutional fabric. But the selves in this in such systems are driven on the one hand by fear, by the fear of losing out, of not being fast enough. But it's now done through parametric optimization, right? You de define parameters of your body, of your mind, of your everything, and but partic particularly also of your capacities and performances in shop, right? In university like Aarhus, there are lots of parameters. How many students do you have? How many research money do you make? How many uh, doctoral uh, degrees do you give per year? How many foreign investments do you have? And so on. Lo lots of parameters. And we need to improve and work on all of, of them incessantly. Other otherwise, we fall back and we cannot maintain what we have. So selves in this society and organizations are driven by fear, but also, mm, quite full. <laughs> There's a, a, but but we are not just the victims of this institutional logic, right? We are also are driven by the hope of extending, expanding our horizon of what we can make available or attainable or accessible in the world. So uh, I, I I call it Weltreichweite, right? So we permanently intend. It's really interesting. You use the word good. Think of when do you tell something, oh, that's really good? My claim is we always use this term if someone tells you that his or her uh, horizon of availability, attainability, accessibility has grown, right? If someone earns more money, if someone has a faster internet access or a bigger house or a, a new degree or diploma or so, it's always this logic of uh, um, Increasing the horizon of what we can make visible, of what we can make controllable, accessible, usable, and so on. Okay, and the, and now my claim is that this actually creates a mode of aggression on the individual and on the collective side towards the world, right? A mode of struggle, right? People, s s s um, individuals in this society and, and organizations are always in a kind of, you could say, combat mode, in a mode of aggression, right? I mean, you see it in, on the individual side in the morning. I, I always ask, how do you get up in the morning? Not when you slept enough or when the sun comes up or when the cock crows. 
but you're but you're awoken by the alarm clock. You're uh, alarmed to the world, and then you confront the to-do list. Right? You're in a mode of aggression, and this mode of aggression uh, it has a complementary side in the in the collective side. Our society, right? We are in a kind of science tries to peer deeper into the universe, deeper into matter and so on. Technology tries to get a better hold of everything. The economy is in a permanent mode of aggression. So individually and collectively we are in a in a mode of aggression against the world. The world becomes a series of points of aggression. And I actually think Lostrup in, uh, in, in his um, in, uh, ethical demand, he distinguishes between two interpretations of The, of life on the one hand at least two maybe maybe more but also of different forms of he's always uh, wondering whether we are self-concerned right or this kind of closure in yourself it reads sometimes a bit like luther right the homo in covatus in cx ipsum totally being immersed in oneself and then you are focused of course lestrup would say even such a self clearly has relations but these relationships are then based on reciprocity and i would also say also on responsibility right it's your responsibility to do something and if i i do something for you if you do something for me in return so you only invest in such a logic into a relationship we talk like this i invest into a relationship if it follows this logic of money commodity money prime i invest in a friendship or i, in, I invest in love if I get something back, right? If it, people sometimes talk like this, Eva Ilus has written a lot of it, right? If you, you, in parship or so, when you go to the internet and you try to find a partner, right? People might actually say, you know, we are together and as long as, it's, as you profit from it and I profit from it, let's do it. And if we don't profit anymore, then we finish it, right? That's, the, that's exactly the mode of, uh, I would say it's the mode of aggression and it follows this logic of capital accumulation, you could say. I mean, how, what, what kind of mode of life is this? Right? It's really one where people have a mindset, and I don't blame them, where we all the time try to accumulate, increase. We follow this logic, right? We try to accumulate and, uh, and increase um, the, the capital we have, either in terms of money, you have to make money. We have to secure money. Maybe you have to try to get more money. That's economic capital. But also health. You know, Max Weber says, He quotes Walter, uh, 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 ben, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, remember that time is money. Right? And of course, people, uh, he says, well, don't sit just lazily around. You could work and make money. And then I, I thought, well, but in modern society, most people, young people, for example, are not so much concerned about making money. That's true. But even parents will tell them or they will tell themselves, well, remember that time is Time is health. It's bodily capital, right? You could do something for your health. Go for a walk, go to the gym, uh, try mindfulness or something else, right? So I would really say if people are not obsessed with money, they are very often obsessed with their bodily capital. And to the bodily capital or embodied capital, it's it's it not just health. It's also the good looks, right? Try to have more muscles and uh, I don't know what else. You could somehow get an operation to get Away, do away with the wrinkles or so on. So that's another form of capital. Then the body becomes really a field of aggression too. And the logic is you accumulate bodily capital or embodied capital. And you might, if you sit at home, right, and you're not working and you're not going to the gym, you might think that time is social capital. You could actually call your older colleagues and see maybe he has got, he's got a good job offer for you or so, right? I mean, social capital relationships, are always a form of capital because, as Bourdieu reminds us, right, we can always draw on those we know whom we can call if we need or so. And so we are investing either in economic capital or in health, in uh, embodied capital or in social capital or in cultural capital in the form of education or in uh, symbolic capital trying to uh, to improve on our uh, recognition scale. So that's the lot. That's one form of That's one form of leading a life and one form of forming relationships, right? The relationships then follow this logic of accumulation and are basically driven by a mode of aggression, right? And I think at the collective level or on all three levels, my claim is that this is leading to a huge problem why we need the ethical demand and maybe Löstrup. Because in the end, in this way, we realize a form of life, a collective form of life in Denmark and in Germany and the EU, 
which we can define as a mode of aggression on three levels. On the macro level, we are in aggression towards nature, right? You see it with the extractive industries. We have to have more and more. Even Alaska is no longer sure and so on. Uh, and it, maybe we, we need Mars and the moon, right? To extract things, increasing the horizon of availability, attainability, accessibility. And and thereby we pollute it and we heat it up. I, I really want to look at the energy. I think my next book will be on social energy, so circulating social energy, but also on how social energy relates to psychic energy, of course, but also to the, the physical energy we use up. And I think we have an energy problem, right? Because heating up the climate actually means, um, by burning it up, it means even accelerating the atmosphere, right? So we burn up the atmosphere and we burn out from the inside on the micro level, which comes here, right? It's interesting, right? We have a we have a heat problem down here, and we have a heat problem up there. And wherever you go in the world right now, people tell you that, they, that we have incredible mental health problems, right? They are really there's a new study in Germany which says now it's about it's way beyond forty percent who say they are close to burnout. But when you look to the data on young people, it's really really frightening, right? I think this is, uh, for, uh, for me, burnout is a consequence of the mode of aggression, as are maybe the fact that the autoimmune uh, deficiencies are increasing. <laughs> maybe even this is a sign of autoaggression. And I think we see, in, we definitely see there's empirical data which proves it increasing aggression on the social level between people, uh, for example, politically, right? The, the Trump fans are ready to kill the the liberals and and the other way around, and the Brexiteers are ready to to kill the Remainers, and in Germany those who are in favor of vaccination, those who are against it, and so on. And even in Brazil or in India, you see this kind of polarization, which might now also take hold in Denmark and um, on the middle level. And even war has come back to our society. I, f I find this really threatening uh, and and frightening and frustrating. Right in the twenty first century, we are back to a situation where the plague, the pandemics, which is a form of the plague, and the war are our worst problems, right? Those have always been the problems of mankind. So actually, I think we didn't move a step ahead since since man came along on Earth. But in, in addition to these problems, plague and war, we also have uh, the climate crisis and the nuclear threats. So it doesn't look like we have made much progress with this form of life and this form of relationship. So now, interestingly, Along all these levels, nature, social relationships, and even self-relationships, we do have counter-concepts, right? We do have the idea of a different form of relationship. And this is why I think we do not have to invent something new. It's already there. I think it, I find this really interesting. We have it on all forms, right? So when people think of love, the modern conception of love is not in a mode of aggression. It's not in a mode of capital accumulation, right? It's a, it's a, it's re, it's it's not that you want something through love. The idea is that love is a pure form of relationship in itself, right? And it's the same with the um, family ties, right? You don't want to capitalize on your kids. At least you shouldn't, right? I mean, it's yeah, yeah it's quite interesting that we see that that it's not true that family ties and family relations are immune to the logic of aggression and accumulation. They are very much infused and, and penetrated with it. But our conceptions of how you should raise your children, right? And I think it's not just lip service. It's true. The idea is that you kind of, that we relate to the children as a, as a pure relationship. You want to develop them, right? To give them their voice, to see them grow independent of making use of them, of increasing your your horizon. I will come back to this in a in a in a, in a second. I mean, I find this yeah, I find this interesting when you watch Hollywood movies, right? You can really see it's always the same story. I mean, it's interesting to think about it sociologically. Why do they they only have this one message? Family ties, right? It always comes back to the family ties, right? And the world is getting bleaker and bleaker and darker and darker. It's full of thugs and and warlords and criminals and everything is bad, but there is the family. So modern society really has, it, it, we construe the family as this counter world to the logic of accumulation and aggression, right? Um, and there's also, there's, there's an amazing amount of conceptions of friendship as a counter sphere, right? True friendship. 
I mean, it's the modern notion of friendship is the same. It's in the same sense, right? It's not putting each other to use. It's not a kind of capital investment, but it's a it's the antonym of, a, of instrumental relationship. You might know the, the the Intouchables, the the DVD or the movie, the film. I mean, right? It even says les différentes approches du monde, the different forms of Weltbeziehungen. I I I would say or Band of Brothers, or the World uh, World Cup Wishes. It's, it's two other interesting books where you ca just can see that we have very vibrant and alive conceptions of true friendship, what it, what it means to have a true friend. Sheila, for example, you might know Sheila, the pledge, right? He says, friendship is the highest form of relationship in this world. So we have other forms of intimate family relations and friendship. But there's also this idea of solidarity. Young people, when they are frustrated, I mean, there's so much anger in the world, right? And then you think, what would you want to have different? Probably they wouldn't talk about love and friendship, but about solidarity between human beings, right? This is still a strong conception that there should not be just competition, but solidarity. And I think solidarity clearly is a form of relationship that is beyond. It's non-aggressive and it's not, not in, in this accumulative logic, right? And we have this strong sense that our relationship to nature is strong, right? So this is why sustainability is, is such a has an attractive force and in, in, in deep environmentalism and things like that, right? A different form of relating to nature, not just using it. You see it in animal protection, but also in people caring about the glaciers or about the forests. It's a different sense of relating to nature, right? And then we have things like mindfulness. It's the yearning for a different form of relating to ourselves, not in the mode of aggression. I have to, to I have to become slimmer and 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 tanner and uh, more athletic, and I don't know anything else, and, and I don't know what else. But it's the idea of mindfulness, a different form of relating to the self and with the self to the world, right? So what I want to say is that in all the spheres which I just tried to present to you as spheres of aggression, we have counter conceptions, right? There are different forms of relationship, different forms of self-relationship, different forms of social relationships, different form of relationships to the environment and different forms of intimate relationships. So, and I think this, what I try, try to present is two different forms of um, uh, of self-world relationships to find in Löstrup as two conceptions of life or the two dominant conceptions of life. Now I want to, now of course you might, you might uh, already uh, guess my idea is that we can actually we can we can kind of define this other form of relating to the world as resonance right resonance is a different form of relating to the world it's by its very nature that's not so good <laughs> is it just on my screen but i don't know but you will deal with this i can actually go through resonance without looking at it <laughs> So it's a different form of a uh, relationship, which is not in its in, in itself in any form um, um, a, a aggressive. You know, I mean, you can if you look at it philosophically. Of course, it's close to what Adorno and Horkheimer say that this modern way of being in the world and to the world, right, is trying to get control, to gain control, make the world verfügbar in all its aspects, right, to dominate and to control. And what I just said about these other forms of relationships, they do not. They, they, by their very definition, cannot ask for control or domination. But resonance is a different form of relating to things, to people. And it has four elements. And the first element is affection. Something speaks to me, right? All of a sudden you are touched by something. It can be something you hear, music, for example, or a talk. It can be someone you meet. Right? Of course, it can be erotic attraction or whatever. It can be erotic or just someone you find interesting, right? Or a child that comes up to you or so, or even a cat that is, is, is around your feet, right? All of a sudden, you are touched by something. something. So the interesting thing is that uh, for me, resonance starts at least conceptually, not with something I do, but with something that is done to me, something that affects me. All of a sudden, Bruno Latour, who has already given a Futures series, a future lecture, a lecture in the future series. <laughs> he says, hearing a call, right? You feel, you feel called by something. I think this is the crisis, the psychological crisis of our time. We lost the capacity to hear a call. 
right? We think I have to do this, I have to do that, to do that. There's this parameter and that parameter which I need to optimize, and you never feel called by something, right? It starts with really, it's you know, it's a world relationship. Some the world, something, some part is calling me. So that's the first part of resonance, and then the second is you answer it. Right, you reach out to it. You seek to connect to it. I think that's also the core of building of education. What young people are asking for this form of relationship. I mean, why do you come to such a lecture? Right, well, I really claim it's the hope for some form of resonance that something might happen. It doesn't have to be me. One of the other uh, the, the discussions, or someone your neighbor says, or some idea you get when you walk out, or so right. Um, it, it, but something that speaks to you, right? Something that somehow affects you, something that seems significant to you. And the interesting part, it only becomes resonance when you answer it. You do something with the idea, right? It affects you, you react to it, and it might change you. And by the way, here, the affection that you kind of feel affected because it's important to you. Of course, that's, that I think is what uh, Löstrup tries to capture with natural love, what he says we have to the people we love or our children, right? It's a kind of we naturally feel affected to them, right? And I, But I think actually what I think in resonance goes maybe beyond Löstrup, at least I didn't read it in, in the parts I've read, is this kind of that it's a kind of double for me it's a kind of you know it's resonance is a movement it's a dynamics which always has this two sides something moves in and something moves out that is what creates the dynamics and this opposing what i call emotion from immobere moving outward has this sense of self-efficacy i have the capacity to reach out to the other right this is what Löstrup discusses when he says when i love someone i have the hope that i'm loved back that i'm loved too but I think there he construes kind of two. I don't. I'm not sure. I think two. I mean, two equivalent parts. It's almost he says himself. It's a form of reciprocity. But I think it's a a process. Something going in and something moving out from both sides. Right. I mean, that's the that's the nature of resonance. And it can, of course, it has a dialogical side. We discussed it this morning. Buber writes on this in the Ich Du Beziehung. Right. It's this form of something is moving inward it's touching me it's moving me it's gripping me right and i answer it i move out to it and if this happens i'm not staying the same right it's what people say when they make experiences strong experiences of resonance they would say after that i was a different person when you do biographical in interviews this happens very often people tell their life and say something uh, happened to me and after that i was a different person i was transformed right and but the, but then the fourth and the final point is what I call unverfügbarkeit, and this is why why resonance is kind of at odds with the lo modern logic of control of verfügbarkeit, verfügbarmachung, because you cannot buy resonance, you cannot bring it about, you cannot engineer it. You never know when it happens. You go to such a talk, but maybe there is no resonance. You find it totally boring. Rosa said all of this already last year. Well, I, I will move to the new parts in a minute, right? <laughs> And so, so maybe there is no resonance. It's the same. You go to a museum. You hope that one of the paintings will speak to you, but maybe it doesn't. Or maybe you go on a holiday trip. You hope that you will really get into a new form of experience with nature or with a different form of culture. But maybe it's boring. You find the same boring hotel which you've always found. So, so you don't know whether it happens. And what is worse, if it happens, you don't know what it is, right? Maybe there is a new idea today which you have not heard before, but you have no clue what it is and what it does to you and what the result will be, right? So resonance is essentially unpredictable, uh, unverfügbar, which is uh, this is uh, totally important for me. Now I now I actually I will go over this very quickly. I just claim that these forms of resonance can come in four axes or four dimensions, right? One is resonance between human beings, and this is where I will go next with love and friendship, right? As I've already said, we think of a love relationship as a resonant relationship and of friendship as a resonant relationship. And I believe that democracy only works if there is some assumption of it. I'll come back to it with a solidarity point, right? But then we also have resonances with things, with objects, with objects of art, but in fact also with the objects. <laughs> there is some new problem. <laughs> Actually, that's alienation, right? If the thing is... <laughs> So, we, but we have it with objects, with objects we work on, or with, um, for example, if you're, if actually I have a doctoral student working on trucks and the truck driver, the truck drivers really develop a 
form of resonance with their cars, right? You have to listen to the engine. You have to develop a feel for it. You have to answer it and so on. So uh, that's what I call the di diagonal or material forms of, um, of uh, can I, can I move it? Yo, good. <laughs> and then I think there is a kind of what I call vertical or existential form of, it, it, it's a connection of resonance to life or nature as a whole. Löstrup writes about this, he, has, he uses really life, trust in life, relationship to life um, uh, overall. And there is, can be something like, you know, the opposite of self-objectification um, or reification, when you do parametric optimization, you, you, you actually consider yourself as a, as, a, as, a, as a couple of parameters, as a whole sum of parameters, and then you work on them. Then you're not in resonance, right? Being in resonance with your soul, your psyche, or your body means listening and answering. That's the mindfulness part, right, in this sense, right? So this is mindfulness. Uh, um, sustainability, um, which actually I'll come back to that in a second, and solidarity on this uh, on, on this uh, count, right? So and, and now, as I always say, resonance is not harmony. Actually, resonance requires, and Löstrup says this very cl clearly. He insists that we never feel what the other feel, the one we love, for example, right, or we are fr friends with. It, there is always, there remains essential difference. And because I do not completely feel what you feel, even if I'm in love with you, there can be resonance between the two. So we can only resonate with something that is other, that is perceived as other. So difference is a necessary requirement, right? It's, I, I claim, it's not creating identity. It's not creating fusion, right? Resonance lives on the fact that you encounter some other which you ac accept as an other, as a difference. But then you can bridge the difference at the price of changing who you are, right? So I think we have theories of identity and we have theories of difference. And resonance is kind of bridging the gap temporarily at the price of changing who one is. And by the way, I find this, uh, this, uh, this quite interesting when uh, uh, Löstrup contemplates on loneliness. Um, you can really see, uh, or I, at least my interpretation is that there are two forms of loneliness in German. The language is quite nice. One is Einsamkeit, the, uh, being Einsam. The other is Alleinsein, right? And, and the, you know the, what the difference is? I mean, if you're isolated, the bad form of, uh, of uh, Einsamkeit, right, is being cut off from everything, which means nothing resonates, right? I'm totally alone. It's the empty, Löstrup talks about this too, right? It's the empty, silent universe world you live in. Alleinsein is the, is, is the opposite experience, right? Sudhir Kakar, he's an Indian psychoanalyst. He says there are moments of Alleinsein, which is, creates a kind of erotic field between the subject and the world. It's like hundreds of threads which are calling you. You feel... In, in a kind of resonance with the universe or with nature, with life, with your surroundings, right? So there are two forms of, 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 uh, of connecting to the world. So now let's look at love and friendship. Now, I as I already sa I said, I think that love is really defined along the four elements of resonance, something affecting you. And it's incomplete love if only I love someone, but the other person does not love you back. I mean, right, as we know, this is uh, quite can be quite hurtful. I would say it's incomplete resonance. But if it's a uh, real resonance, right, then it's the exactly consisting of those four elements. It's not just that I'm deeply affected by someone, I have the capacity to answer and to reach out and to actually touch the other too. And this always has a transformative effect, the art of love, as Fromm would say. And of course, uncontrollability is an essential feature of love. If you can control the other, love is dead. Right? But nevertheless, people try to seek about it. And there's also a problem of looking for the partner through the Tinder or something, right? You want to have complete control about whom you meet, right? I think this is kind of ki killing the uh, uncontrollability requirement in love. <clears throat> okay, and for, uh, for uh, Lustrup also talks about the relationship to children. Of course, we have this, what he calls natural love. The idea is that you develop a resonant relationship to your child. You want to listen as closely, as purely as possible and to answer with your own voice in order to allow this 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 child to develop right to uh, to um, uh, to develop his or her voice in, uh, in a kind of 
constant dialogue with you, right? So uh, we, we think of, as I already said, um, uh, intimate relationships as well as um, um, relationship to children as forms of pure love, right? So love is our, and, and, and it's so hard to, to, uh, to realize it, to achieve it in a world that is running on uh, parametric optimization and dynamic stabilization. And it has a number of psychological preconditions and dispositions, right? You have to accept now, your vulnerability, I mean, as we all know, falling in love means making your, yourself vulnerable in, in many aspects and respects, right? And uh, this is why Löstrup talks a lot about the necessity of trust, right? You have to kind of make a jump because, as I said, you know, resonance, the logic of a resonant relationship is you let yourself be affected and touched by something which you cannot control. And this means you will be transformed in a way you cannot control. And this is super risky. And I would actually say in a, in a society, in a social structures where you have to optimize um, and where you are in permanent competition, it's an irrational behavior. You should not actually enter into resonance. Right? And this is, creates the tension of modern life, right? On the one hand, our yearning for resonant relationships. On the other hand, a structural logic, which actually says it's mad, don't do it, right? It's also because you don't know the outcome of such a relationship. And this is why people, of course, try to control whom they fall in love with. You do this through Tinder and other things, right? And they say, well, it will only last as long as we both profit from it along the parameters. That's very difficult, right? And it's clear that if you are traumatized, if you have made the experience that being touched is being hurt, then you will not enter into such a relationship, right? So basic trust is a psychological and uh, an existential requirement, which is quite difficult. And as I said, as you all know, we cannot enforce love. If no one loves you or you don't love anyone, you cannot bring it about. And certainly you cannot bring it about that you fall in love with that person because he, he or she has the highest form of capital for you. That doesn't work at all, right? All right. So uh, this is why I like to talk about the Gita model of the self, right? A self is only capable of love uh, if it's open enough to be touched or affected, right? but closed enough to answer in his or her own voice, right? It's this dual, it's an actually, it's a dual um, condition, a dual requirement, being open enough and being closed enough for being open enough for touched and uh, being open enough to be uh, transformed, but being closed enough uh, to, to answer. So you have to have the capacity to let yourself be touched and you have to have enough trust in self-efficacy that you will be capable in answering, right? And I really think there is a lack in the self-efficacy individually and socially, right? But a lot, sometimes people ask me after I give a talk, well, what do I do if someone lacks the capacity of, 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 of resonance, right? And I think it's not so much a lack in the capacity of being affected, but it's a lack in the capacity of answering self-efficacy, right? I mean, you, you see it in social discourse. I mean, when people say, if we let all the foreigners, the migrants come to Denmark or Germany, then we will be transformed. Well, the thing is, yes, then Denmark will change, but it's not just something that will happen to the Danes and they will be the victims, right? It's a process of transformation, but you need to have self, the trust in self-efficacy. We will be capable of answering and dealing with it and developing. Okay. And as I already said, the relationship is essentially open-ended. You don't know what the result is and when it will end in these forms, right? But what I really find interesting, you know, I mean, loving someone is very interesting. Is this active or passive? Think of it. I love you. Hmm. Is it active or passive? Of course, we would say it's active because I do something, but the sensation of love is beyond my doing, right? It's kind of, I'm, it, it's affection. It's done to me. So I would really say love is in itself is a kind of, it's in between active and passive. It's something that happens to me. Right? This is why we say I was falling in love. Right? I was falling in love doesn't sound like something I'm actively doing, right? So love and, and all forms of resonance, right, are already forms of medio passivity. It's like you listen to music. I mean, it, it, it's already interesting listening to music. Is that active or passive? Again, the, grammat the grammatical form is active. I listen. But in fact, you hear, right, something is calling you. It's very hard to not listen to it. I mean, you could decide I, I won't listen. I will follow my own thoughts. But listening to music is already is also in a medio passive voice, right? Um, something something is done to you. Something is you do. 
So and uh, and and this I find really interesting because Lustrup really talks a lot about whether it's self-regarding or other regarding. We have in sociology and in economics, of course. All the time we have discussions about egoism or altruism, right? Do do you do it for yourself or do you do it for others? And I think the whole text of Lustrup, for me, this is the strongest sense. <laughs> Can I do something against? Just press. Okay, okay, fine. Um, whatever. <laughs> so I think I I think I, I always thought so too. It's it's just wrong to ask. It's in, in in love, right? Do you do you love for yourself or for the other? I mean, of course you could say you do it for yourself, but it's you when you love someone, you are ready to do everything for this other person, right? So he says, Löstrup says it's one act. And I think this is really important. And when I prepared this lecture, I realized it for the first time, right? That my idea with the, I was always fighting this idea of egoism and altruism, right? And uh, because I thought, well, if you really, you know, if resonance works, right, it's kind of something going on between us and it's good for me and good for you. And uh, Löstrup really is very good in explaining, you don't think of it. What do I gain? What do you gain? It's so stupid, right? I mean, the good the good thing is is in the in between. It's the interconnection, and of course, if a if a mother loves the child or a father, of course, parents love their children. Do they do it for themselves or do they do it for the children? That's what Lustrup asks, and he says it's stupid question, right? I mean, they do it for themselves and for the children, right? Because it's the relationship which is the which is the which is the good they are aiming at. And I think this is really true for all forms of, of resonance, but you see it clearly in love. The question is, it's, is love self-regarding or other-regarding is a non-question, right? It's it's wrong. And, you know, I mean, even, I, I mean, I do, okay, when I do, for example, when I do something, even in, the, I do summer camps for highly talented, I always come back to this example. For highly talented uh, students, so it's about 100 students, right? And it all, all the time, I think it's a kind of it's a reson it's a resonance explosion that happens every summer, right? So if I ask, do it, do I do it for me or do I do it for them? I think that's a stupid question too, right? I mean, I do it because it's such a great experience for me and for them. So, so it's so. Um, it's the medial passivity and this overcoming of egoism versus altruism is important. And and Lökstrup says it's wrong to think. It's not just an action where I gain something and you gain something, and then we can see what I gain and what you gain. But the gain is in the in-between. It's the relationship itself, right? And there are other forms of this relationship, but my favorite form is dancing. I have to make it again, even so I think I did it last year here. <laughs> um, when two people dance, right, you could say it's a, it's a kind of medio passive in the sense it depends on what dance it is, but it's a dance. It's a, a Lindy Hop, I think, which is a, a variation of tango. And the thing is that it's not always the man leading or not always the woman leading. It's a kind of in-between. And therefore, you could say it's a medio passive dance. At one point, the one person is leading. At the other point, the other per person is leading. But the dance is at its best, at the climax, when you cannot tell who is leading. It's as if the dance leads, right? What's going on? But it's the in-between. We, we also know this from making music when people... Im oh, no, it's not true. Oh fuck! <laughs> when I should do, I already done it. Okay, I, I swear I'll be done quickly. <laughs> so Hannah Arendt. So I really want to go to Hannah Arendt at this point because she says that's the moment of natality. That's when the new is born, right? It's starting in the in this interspace, in the inter in 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 the in between, right? And now the 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 point I really want to make is that for me resonance implies an ethics of care, which is something we want to get at co collectively. Why is this? It's because when you're in resonance with something, it, this can be a person, it can be a child, it can be a, 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 the person you love, but it can be a piece of music. Maybe I'm in resonance with Beethoven, right? Let, let's assume this because in the other t times it's clear. When I'm in resonance with Beethoven, I somehow will not like it if Beethoven is played in the supermarket or in the elevator or so, right? I think, no, that's not doing justice to, to it, right? It's this sense of I want to kind of preserve it in the in in its own voice, in its own uh, in, uh, reality, right? Resonance is you know it's the experience that something out there is really important. It it it's a, a source of value in itself. It's not because I like it, but it's really important. It's like people want to preserve ice bears or glaciers, not because they are good resources for us. That's what Lustrup says, right? 
but because it's the it's the feeling, but it's important in itself, right? And therefore, you want to preserve it without being paternalistic. It's not, I know what's good for you in ethics of care, which is paternalistic. I know what's good for you. That's not resonant, right? Resonance is, I want to preserve the voice of the child, of the person, of the homeless, whoever it is, uh, as in itself and as of itself, right? So you, so if you're in resonance, something you will never hurt or destroy it. It's kind of impossible because resonance is the experience of a source of value outside of yourself, right? And what uh, what Charles Taylor calls a strong evaluation. I mean, I don't know how I managed to get up <laughs> to to lose so much time. I think it's basically it's the same with friends. Friendship has the same nature, but there are a few differences, right? Friend, friendship, for example, you know, family is what we do, do deal with in the everyday life, while friends are uh, in the non-extra, non-everyday life, in the extraordinary moments where you go for a walk or so. It's not institutionalized, of course. They can become witnesses of our lives, particularly when uh, when families break apart. It's very important to have that, right? So you could actually say they gain in importance uh, here. It's interesting that there seems to be a there seems to be a limit to care we have for, for friends because you would not kind of care for their bodies when they fall sick while we do it uh while we do it with the uh, with family members right but it's uh but and this i find interesting i just wrote a book on heavy metal <clears throat> and it's interesting a rock band is conceived as a resonance system right and yet there you see that resonance is not just harmony right between Ian Gillen and Blackmore and John Lord, there was a kind of resonance going back and forth, and it's what H Hannah Arendt calls natality. The creativity was in the in the was in the in between, like between Paul McCartney and John Lennon or Roger Waters and Pink Floyd. Uh, and and it's interesting. Readers or rock fans, they always care that the band is preserved, right? That that they even if members change, it's a kind of it's a resonant unity, like in theology, it's the Trinity which needs to be resonant, and so, so I know <laughs> it's the, it's all the same. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, you you will clearly have. Uh, I, I will give uh, whoever is interested. I will give you the slides for this. I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry I I spoke so, for so long, but I, l l let me finish with this. With solidarity, I find this really interesting. You could say, okay, 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 resonant theory might be good for having a friends and even a rock band, but what about the people of the other rock band, right? <laughs> I don't like the other band because I compete with them or with the, with the people I dislike, the, the migrants. They should stay away, right? We have a great resonant Denmark or Germany or whatever it is, so the migrants should be away. Um, so uh, this is where I think Löstrup would say that's where the ethical demand counts. But in my view, and I think he has a similar idea, if you do this, right? I mean, you could say the affection is missing. I'm not affected by the homeless person or by the by the uh, by the migrant, right? But um, so so that but, but so it would mean resonance does not imply care for the others. But my claim is. If you look into the eyes of someone or you hear the voice of someone, a living being, right, there is a kind of call emanating. It's an idea you also find in Adorno Minima Moralia, right? It really means it's it, it, sometimes it's literally someone calling out. When you walk through Aarhus, right, someone might say, oh, can you share a dime, right? Can you give me some, some food or so? And then you really see how you have to dispositionally close or no go away, right? Or whatever you whatever you do to strike him or her off, you see it's a dispositional closure, right? And if as a society, for example, we say, oh, we don't care about the migrants, they should stay away, right? Then you really see in the voice, in the eyes, in the in the hand, in the gesture, this kind of closure. I call it dispositional closure. So I would really say the price of closing yourself off against the call of living beings, it's true for animals too. If, if you the industrial farming is closing our eyes and ears against the pain of the animals, for example, we can do this, right? We can make more profits, right? And get be, be cheaper meat and tasteful meat maybe. But the price is closing off, right? To the to a living animal, uh, to, 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 a, to a part of life which is calling us. And this as a society, this closure to the call, right? This clo closure to affection comes at the price of our loss of resonability. This is why I want to, what to say resonability, being capable, I call it dispositional resonance, individually and so socially, that we are capable of being resonant beings and a resonant society means we need to be callable and able and willing to answer. And this has something to do with attentiveness, right? What are we attentive to? What are we listening to? 
this is why I think what we need to become is a listening society, right? Right now we have this kind of closed angle attention. You could call it concentration on the parameters. Oh, this parameter and that parameter and a little better there and some more steps and a little more mindful and so on, which means we are kind of totally non-attentive to a calling world outside and we pay the price of becoming less and less callable and in that sense we lose our capacity to resonate, which would be very bad. But now we have two uh, discussions and all the open questions we can answer then. Thank you very much and sorry for being too long. Thank you. Lotte and Thomas, please come to uh, the scene. Uh, Lotte, maybe first. Yes, Lotte is professor of anthropology, working on, but you, you've worked quite a lot in Africa, and the themes that you're working on is um, trust, forgiveness also, and uh, time and temporality. And uh, Thomas Schwarz Wenzel is professor in philosophy, uh, working on the philosophical anthropology, existentialism, or existential philosophy and, and hermeneutics. So, um, and you're also interested in forgiveness, but particularly Lotte and I, we have worked quite closely on Hannah Arendt's concept of natality and forgiveness. So I'm afraid we, we, we cannot miss that part. Um, so please, Hartmut, can you begin say My, a few words about forgiveness? So it's still, uh, yeah, okay. It's still, yeah, the, the, the forgiveness part, I think, you know, residence, because of its kind of essential unverfügbar card, right? It, as I said, it makes us always vulnerable. And in the interaction, in the relationships, we are always hurt, right? It's kind of impossible to not get hurt in this process, right? I mean, there are always moments of friction, and some of those frictions hurt, right? And, the, the, and our normal reaction to hurt is closure, right? So if some, something hurts, I kind of try to, to close against the, the, the other. And therefore, I think individuals as well as societies can only be, be remain resonant if they overcome this process of, 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 of closure. You actually see it in, a, in an argument which people have in love or in, friend, or in friends, right? Lovers, or, or let's say lovers or friends, they, they reach a point where they argue and then the argument gets somehow bitter. And then there is this, it's very interesting where you actually could see how you fall out of resonance because at first you're kind of deeply you're arguing we arguing is not a problem right but there's a point where it hurts and i say what did you just say you know what just fuck off or something of this sort right <laughs> and that, that yeah, there you see the moment of closure and you really see this in the eyes and in the face and you see it everywhere it's this kind of and you hear it in the voice right and in the words it's kind of now i no longer want to be in this open process of which i cannot control now i want to control i want to dominate and actually i want to hurt at this point and the question is how can we overcome it and it's really interesting. Of course, it requires a moment of forgiveness, of starting anew. And I find it, I would really like to do a phenomenology of it. You can really see if two people are in a kind of hostile, if a relationship turns hostile, when it changes back, you see it, it starts with the eyes, right? The glance changes. You see the openness comes back. I'm, I'm ready to listen again, to try again, right? It's this, it, it's a change in the voice. It's a change in the gesture. It's a, it's a change. In, um, in, in the voice, in the eyes, and in, the, in, 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 in everything, being ready to kind of make a cut and start anew. And this is what uh, Hannah Arendt calls natality, that we are not forced as human beings to simply continue along chains of interaction, which then get more and more bitter, but to, to make, make a break and to get, get this process started again. And maybe what is restored is trust. And trust is the essential element. I mean, we, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I was in Holland recently and I gave talks on Unverfügbarkeit and there was a, a theologian who said he thinks the main problem of society is that we lack trust. And I think that's so true. We lack, as Löstrup says, right, trust in life. Uh, but it, it, re it really means trust in others, for example, even trust in our own body. It, for example, if I get a, a cut here, right, people have the tendency, oh, a doctor needs to look at it, right? I think this is already a sign of, I mean, not trusting life, not trusting others, not trusting the body. We don't even trust our breathing, right? I could pollute, I could k kill myself by breathing. I could, I'm not against wearing masks. I think it was definitely necessary at this time, but it somehow has kind of materialized our distrust in world. Even the basic process of breathing in and breathing out could kill ourselves. Please, I invite you in now, Lade. Wow, thank you very much. 
Well, um, I think I'd like to start with a with a question that does not follow on the the, the forgiveness thing, but um, about time and temporality. And I thought there were certain signs on the computer saying risk of burnout, uh, update uh, the battery is slow. So I think we need to take that seriously and just slow. <laughs> No, but um, I thought I would give you a little break by telling a story of how I, I got to know your work. Students had told me, read this book. This is very important. I looked at it and I thought, I don't have time for that. Yes. You know, who has time to read sick academic books these days? And then the corona epidemic happened and uh, we all had to leave universities. I went to our summer house with the family with our dog, sat by the fire, Boshin was there, and there was suddenly time to read through big books and engage. And this is, it is that precondition of having time that I want to discuss with you because you, on the first page of your book, you say acceleration is the problem, you show us also here, but then resonance is the the solution and I think you do that very convincingly but I'm just thinking hmm, isn't there something about the preconditions for resonance for love for those you know deep emotions and actions to actually happen that needs a kind of slowdown and I know you don't want to be called the deceleration guru but I am I'm I'm also interested in why is why this fear of deceleration? It's almost like a societal fear that we don't we are we're so brainwashed with growth, 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 more you know, more publications every year, bigger grants every year. We want more better. Um to a degree where we almost cannot even think, even you. Our great brain here. That's not true. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm totally accelerated. I always said so, right? <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, 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 I agree with the diagnosis, right? I think, I, I think, on the one, but I nevertheless have changed the diagnosis a bit because I would say acceleration is not per se that. I mean, it's not the structural problem, right? A faster internet connection is not per se bad. It's bad when it goes together with the dynamic stabilization. This need that you can only keep what you have through acceleration, right? So if the doctor comes faster in a case of emergency, that's not the problem either. And by the way, it's very interesting. Bore out has exactly the same. It, it bore out is to, when everything is too slow, right? You have, you sit in a workplace and nothing happens. Then you suffer the same problems at burnout, right? So I, so I would say it's not just that speed is always bad and slowness is always good, right? That's what I, what, what I necessarily, what, what, what I wanted to say. But I, and, and, and I wanted to say that slowness is not an end in itself. It's as you just said, but slowness might be, or deceleration might be a precondition for being capable of getting into resonance. And I totally agree with this because I, I always say, I mean, uh, time pressure is resonance killer number one. It's really true, right? I mean, if I, my, 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 I always use the same example. If I have to get, catch the plane at the airport, I may not listen to your argument, right? Or listen to the music that comes from somewhere or watch this beautiful image. I see I have to become deaf, literally, to catch the plane at the airport. And we are always catching the plane at the airport all the time, right? There's this to-do list I have to... So I agree that uh, that uh, that it, it would help a lot mm -hmm. uh, to slow down, right? But it's not an end in itself. And I would also yeah. say we cannot just slow down. If you slow down in an acceleration society, you just pay the price, right? So we have to change the so social mode, which is dynamic stabilization, which we have to overcome. Right. But we are also, I mean, you write about this yourself, that we are at a point of planetary burnout. Yes. Democratic burnout, auto burnout. So many people suffer from, from burnout and other kinds of stress related. So there's just something about still being stuck in this cycle. That of course. Then we have to jump to a whole other area of, of resonance and love and the economists will be happy with us because then we can yeah. we can run and race and love more and feel more solidarity, but we're still running. 
Yeah, no, that's the huge danger. I mean, this is not how it works. But I mean, it cannot work th this way. I totally agree with you. I mean, I agree with this kind of burnout, and it has to do with the futures. By the way, I did not talk about that, but I really think we are we are approaching a state of collective burnout. This society is in a state of burnout, not just because of ecological reasons, and you can actually see it. One symptom of it's it's really interesting. It's on an individual level. Depression and burnout are very close, right? And you can really describe that in them as chronopathologies, right? It's it's a mm -hmm. it's a it's a disease of our sense of time. And when you're in a depression, you lose the sense of moving towards a future, a meaningful future, and even of having a a, a, a meaningful past. You're kind of disconnected. You're 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 kind of um, uh, suffocating in temporally. And I think this is exactly what we have as a society. We are no longer see a meaningful future we want to move to, right? And there is no there is no conception of the future which we want to have. I mean, there is the climate disaster, there is the war, there is the plague, there is the economic breakdown, lots of apocalyptic images. But for quite some time, we lost the future we want to move to. And I think right now we are also losing the past because we realize the past is not uh, the 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 enlightenment story of progress right at least not just it's also the story of colonialism racism sexism and other things so this is really kind of a, we have lost this temporal sense connecting to the past and connecting to the future yeah so what we need at this point is really what the german word says aufhören right to stop really means listen up right i mean it's interesting the german word aufhören is quite nice we I mean, most of you understand that right it means literally to stop. No, it no, it means it means to stop. But literally, it means hören is listening, right? And auf is upward, right? Stop for a moment, and I would say become callable again. So, so yeah. in that sense, I I would go for a for a stop and for a break. Yeah, I think we have the same word in Danish, uphöher. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hör ab. Und, hör ab. Yeah, yeah, stop. I I like this, right? Hör ab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let yourself be called. Yeah. But I'm also very glad that you mentioned this and you talked about it, the the mental health crisis. Yeah. Um, and 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 also, I'm wondering if we can connect that crisis with the global care crisis and migration that that you talked about. I mean, in Denmark, in the global north generally, I think we we really do see a you know serious mental health crisis. Absolutely. And we're realizing now that we need to invest in it, but it it seems almost too late because the money is being you know given, but there there aren't enough nurses, there aren't enough hands to help. On the other side of the globe, global south, we have quite a lot of people with time, lots of time and care capacities. We don't want to let them in. Um, there's something about the balance in the world regarding this that seems uh and 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 I, I think it's quite interesting that you mentioned this film the intouchables yeah with you know a white man in france who's being taken care of by a black yeah. man from senegal or somewhere which i think you know in a way creates some hope for the scenarios we might see in the future if we want to yeah, but but we are. Yeah, but, but, you. I I, do, I totally I totally agree. I mean, the care crisis. I I would agree. It has the same root like the mental health crisis, and it's a loss of this. It's it's a loss of the resonance capacity, right? Be caring for someone means. I mean, I really. I, I, this is really important for me. I have a doctoral dissertation also kind of being written right mm -hmm. about uh, care and resonance, right? And but uh, but uh, but I really think the the. The decisive point is this this uh, attentiveness, right? Care has a lot to do with attentiveness, right? Being capable of, of 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 perceiving the care needed by the others. But of course, the answer cannot be. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, for the shortage of labor power, of course, I would say immigration seems to be a good solution. But you know, the problem with the care chains, then the um, then, the, for example, the women are taking care of white old men, and they are missing in their own. Uh, so that so that certainly will not be the complete solution there, right? I, I think my my hope really is. I mean, the, the the other point you you raise quite rightly, right? Is how do we we cannot leave the society as it is and just create individual oases of resonance, right? I have my this is exactly what we try to do, right? I have my oasis of my family as a safe haven, right? Or my friends which I cherish, 
and 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 we leave the structure intact. And there are enough studies which prove this this does not work, right? It doesn't work in love. If I lose, it's really good to read, but it doesn't work with families either. And we are really killing our young people with, with this. We we, we 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 train them into this mode of aggression, right? Which makes them incapable of, of resonating, and therefore they have burnout and depression. You know, I find the most telling example is really from South Korea. And there, the pressure is highest, I would say, from all we know, right? I mean, they are so hard pressed for uh, um, getting the high school diploma and getting them a good uh, high degrees and so on. And um, and the, for a number of reasons, the pressure is really highest. And there are now there are there is a kind of the, the, some of the young people really commit crimes to be imprisoned. And they tell you, and this is we really have to think of this. They tell you, only in prison I can really be free for a moment. I mean, think of this. I mean, it's so paradoxical, but it's so easy to understand, right? Because, in, and why is it? Because, I mean, of course, the Weltreichweite, right, is reduced at maximum. That this, the horizon of what is available, attainable, accessible, is almost zero, and therefore, for a moment, you can free yourself from this kind of pressure, right? So we have to change the structures, and the, this we cannot do individually. Mm -hmm. And but I believe that residents can be the yardstick because we know what a resident school looks like, what residence in education is. We know what residence in care is. We know what residence in dealing with animals and plants is. We know what residence in politics and even in the media is. This is why I insisted in the beginning we have this sense of what it would mean to be to be in residence, right? So I want to use the idea to reform our institutions. But it's hard enough. Say more about that. Yeah, what? Say more about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I also want to uh, include Thomas here. Resonance as a yardstick. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that might link to, to the very last remark. I mean, um, I, I'm so impressed by, by your ambition um, in, in resonance book and acceleration book. Coming from philosophy, you know, um, when Hegel said Philosophie ist ihre Zeit in Gedanken gefasst, then you were doing a perfect philosophical job in the sense that, that you're telling what time it is. Um, it's acceleration time, stupid, Bill Clinton would have said, right? So it's, um, it, it, you really put um, uh, the nail on the top. Um, but you're also not but... And you also um, add a normative dimension to the to, to to the notion of resonance, and that's why I now where I now jump in with Adorno. You mentioned him at the very last slide. Es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen, famously a quote in uh, Minima Moralia. Um, and instead of now developing an Adorno lecture, something. No, I want to to to, to tell a story um, from Denmark. Um, you know, in 1996, uh, um, there was uh, the eagle of Herning, Bjarne Ries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bjarne Ries. Um, of something, right? Race of cycle, right. And he, he, he won the Tour de France. Yeah. The first time ever a Danish uh, sportsman did this. Um, and the whole country was, in your theory, was the di uh, di diagonal uh, sphere of resonance and uh, you, do, you do it in the book with, with the Sommermärchen, I take it, 2006, Papi Wu in Germany. You know, imagine Denmark, right? We run the Tour de France and, and, and people uh, who, who uh, d despite the differences, had this fellow feeling, the solidarity, this uh, togetherness, this resonance with Bjarne, with us, the yellow uh, uh, shirt, and um, he even got uh, a celebration with the prime minister celebrating that this was by far the most impressive uh, achievement an individual ever has taken. Then rumors came up. Maybe he was still right. Maybe it was fake. Maybe. And he said, no, it was. Or at least I wasn't tested uh, positive. <laughs> Ten years later, he admitted, he did it. I took all the shit. And it gets all healed. He was it. You know, if resonance, as you're writing in a strong reading in your book, is the sole criterion for a normative assessment of uh, well-being and a resonant life, then the Danes in 1996 were in the state of resonance, at least as an experiential quality they believed to be so. But now, ten years later, it has no... I mean... It, 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 it's 
difficult. It's at least against my ethical intuitions. Yeah. Hence, if resonance is a criterion of evaluation for social cultural practices and life forms as such, as with Rahel Yegi uh, mm-hmm. in the book also would would, would um, insist, um, I would, I I I I cannot see it as more than just in quotation marks a necessary condition for well being, mm. not a sufficient condition. Because, um, for instance, as the example could show, and in terms of love and solidarity, I could also had framed the example with the uh, informal um, informants in, in the DDR, where even marriages, um, as, as you know, in Eastern Germany, mm. um, years later you find out that the person you're in love with was an informal, an IM from the Stasi, right? Where somebody who, who, who just told the authorities uh, what you have done. So the, the example sh- uh, shows or, or wants to, 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 to ask you whether resonance is, um, uh, it, it's, these are two questions connected. Is resonance uh, only a necessary condition? Um, and if, if, if it is only necessary, what is the sufficient, sufficient condition? And here again, coming from philosophy, I would suggest something like uh, justice or other ethical uh, criteria, at least as a, as, as a fallible um, and, and not substantial. Um. The other thing is, who is in charge to, to, to assess? If it is an experiential quality, then the subject, him or herself, then the people in 96 were resonant. Or it is the social expert, the theorist of resonance, who is capable of assessing life forms and structures also with the historical distance and assess them whether or not these really are genuinely resonant or not. But then the notion of resonance loses its um, experiential character which was so strong in the first place, mm. um, also so convincing, by the way, in, in the acceleration book, because you, you with, with both concepts, you try to, 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 to gap or to close the gap between micro and macro sociology, between the, the, the actor agent perspective and the systemic perspective, right? But, but here, I see a problem. Mm. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Convince me. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I mean, obviously, I think this is a very important point, and I think, of course, the, a lot of arguments are. Uh, uh, I can see the strength of your argument and the problem, right? But I, I still have the hunch. I want to try, right, to be kind of monomaniac and claim no. It's. I would really still, at least, I would try, right, g- g- giving you the point. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but I, I want to try to say no. Resonance is the criterion, and actually, a life in resonance. I have a, I have, a, I mean, what is a good life? I would really say a good life is a life which is um, uh, kind of um, uh, able to establish and sustain axis of resonance in all four dimensions, socially, materially, di- existentially, and in the self realm, right? But then that is a good life, and I do don't I claim I do not need ex- a, additional criteria. And let me yes. let me take your uh, your example, right? I mean, the question would be with Bjarne Ries, right? whom do we claim resonance for, right? I mean, so was there for a moment kind of resonance within the Danish people? Well, maybe, right? With a, I mean, not for everyone, of course. Not for yeah, everyone. yeah, but that's the point. Many. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the point, right? You you would, in, in forms of resonance, you would never say for everyone. You would just have to look at it, you know. My main, my first answer really would be that I say, Resonance for me is not just subjective experience. I always say resonance in the first place is not a, an equality of the subject. It's a form of relationship, right? And I can actually measure, or I can, you, you probably, I can measure these relationships along the four criteria, right? So for example, my, my, my favorite example is if we two discuss, right? And I say after the discussion, it was such a resonant conversation and you say, it was the total opposite, right? He, de- he never listened once, right? He just he, he never listened to my arguments. He didn't even understand it, right? I think actually people could judge, or if you could have a camera, we could see were the criteria of resonance satisfied, which means listening and responding, taking up yeah. the arguments, being transformed by it, right? So I would, because you said who judges, I think there is some in between, right? Not just the subject, because I, st- I say it's so resonant, right? I might be wrong. It wasn't resonant. I was talking to myself, right? I was kind of, 
convincing myself, but no one else. I never listened to you. So I was wrong in my judgment. I think that's possible. That doesn't necessarily mean that you or someone else is in a better condition, but it's possible, right, to say that, uh, to, to, to judge it from the outside. You, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, yes. it's possible to be self delusion to have delusions about oneself, even though it's hard to say someone else, the expert, can do it, right? And look, I mean, what is wrong with this Fiona Reese thing? I mean, what I mean, I would say it's possible that for a certain segment of society, at least, they got a kind of resonance in the sense of listening and answering. I react to it, and then I go out to the street, and I met people I'd never met before, and we talked to each other, and actually I learned things about my neighbor I hadn't known. I would say that's resonance, right? And it's not non-resonance because Fiona Reese was dope, right? Mm. So, and I would actually, I would ask you back, what was wrong with the doping? Exactly. It, it, yes. Yeah, it's, I think I find this really interesting and because I would say the criteria you would then have to bring in, right? I don't think it's justice. I mean, maybe I'm not against justice, right? But I would say, of course, I'm not against justice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really think there are two problems with doping. One is a kind of self-instrumentalization. What Bjarne Ries does is non-resonant to his body. He kind of, it, it's an aggressive self-relationship. The other is he's lying to the others, to his exactly. competitors. Yes, and the lying is a non-resonant relationship. So what you criticize is the total lack of resonance between Bjarne Ries and, but, you know, lying is killing resonance. And that's the same in this, you know, the say I'm, I'm done in a second, right? Uh, the, the other example is very interesting. You, you said in East Germany, let's say, two yeah. people in love. There are, I would say there are two possibilities. If the one person only faked love, right? Then, of course, that's a crime. Then it wasn't resonant because because I only try to convince you, oh, you are so nice, I love you, and then I think I'll... Bo yeah. That's not resonance because clearly it does not satisfy the four criteria, right? Being, But if they really were in love and the other the person just wasn't I am, which they didn't know, then it was still resonance, I would say. But would it then also be um, a, li a, a good life? I mean, I, I mean that that's the Adorno quote, right? Es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen. Let's say that 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 those uh, that, that the couple, both of them, sincerely love each other. They are affected in love, but still one is cheating to um, on a different uh, scale of of very important values. Um, would we really mean that this life is is a good life? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I find the Adorno quote quite convincing in a certain sense, not in a complete sense. I would really say what you said, what we said, we live in a system of um, uh, of dynamic stabilization. Yeah. I, I see it in my life. You all see it in your life, right? We are, All the time, we have to make kind of compromises between optimization and resonance. All the fucking time, I would really say. And I really, I, I even think I, I can become a the theologian too. If When I sit in an examination in my office, right, I really think, that's probably what the Christians mean with original sin, because there is a student in front, let's say in front of me, and I think, I know for this person, if I now give him an A or her, right, it would really help him or her so much, right? It would really probably kind of, but I don't know, let's dramatize it and say save her life. But on the other hand, I don't want to cheat on the criteria for an examination and on sociology. So I cannot give her an A. She didn't know anything, right? So I should give her a D. So I would say that's what it means. There is no right. There, there's no right in under wrong conditions. I mean, I think we permanently have to to live in that sense. I think the the, the this I A I M thing. I mean, it, the, you know, I don't know. The problem I see is only just that that um, uh, resonance is the soul. You, in the book, you would all even use the, um, the monism of resonance I, at yeah. some point as the soul criteria. Yes, it is the soul criteria. Now I have the answer. <laughs> I really think, you know, I, I insist on the sole criteria because I think whenever you have the feeling there is something else, yeah. I can really show no, it's resonance. And now let's look at, I think I was confused by your question because the, there are two questions. One is, is it still true love? The other is, is it a good life? And I would say the the I am, the, the Stasi yeah. person is not leading a good life because he, in so many situations, it's exactly closure, right? I cannot really speak my voice and I cannot be honest with you and I have to be careful against uh, transformation. So I would say this is a kind of clearly damaged life. So th this I am person, I mean, if you have to fake your identity, right, to try to get information from others, I mean, he might not do it in the loving relationship, but in others, it's so clearly permanently violating the logics of resonance that he is not having a good life. 
but that does not. Ne I would have to know more about the relationship he's having with the with the if, or she is having. My him, my intuition would be that oh, this strikes back to to the ignorant person who all through her life thought that she was engaged with a different person. Yeah. And this kind of betrayal yeah. then uh, backwards yeah. from historical experience and new knowledge okay, okay, re-evaluates what, what I thought to be resonance so that there, what, what was experienced in T1 as resonance is not resonance any longer in T2. And that means that, that you have to account for true resonance or um, non-genuine or faked resonance. And hence we have we, we we are in need of more criteria. Half a mass, for instance, would take, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, sorry, is, yeah. is, you know, uh, Wahrhaftigkeit, yeah. uh, normative Richtigkeit, Wahrheit. And, and, and that would be three uh, possibilities to, to, you know, to tune the resonance criterion to make it a really successful, in my view. Um, uh, yeah. It's, Substitute for yeah. philosophical ethics. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll bring Lotte in and then open for yes. questions. Um, not Habermas, but Lotte Meinert. Well, thank you. And I don't think I, I'm not going to continue. We already had a discussion about the dark side of the, the possible dark side of resonance that yes. you are um, rejecting. Yeah. And um, we might invite you a little more often to always to con convince you that maybe maybe the maybe the theory would be even more strong if you could include this. But my question <laughs> I'm an anthropologist. I work in Africa. Um and so far most of your work and your thinking is receiving quite a lot of resonance from from this quite white audience here. Um, I'm just wondering how is your work being received in the global south and is this, I mean sometimes acceleration is not exactly the problem there, sometimes stagnation is a problem, uh, but is this a universal theory for all of us um, or is it something very specific historically maybe even you know a little bit romantic middle class Christian yep. Europe yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, I just let me say maybe my, one sentence on the dark side. I mean, you know, I just want to try. I, I, I really think. I mean, why? I, I mean, there are lots of dark sides in our lives, right, and in society, right. And there are a lot of dark sides connected to phenomena of resonance. The only thing I, I think, is that that that, that the criteria of judgment is itself resonance, right? That the capacity to 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 to, to resonate. I think I would insist on this. Well, when it comes to the global south, I mean, it's quite funny. I was invited to China a few quite quite a time, some time ago because they wanted me to speak about how they can accelerate development and other things. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, no, that's not the right one. But uh, <laughs> but no, but the fact is, I mean, I think I think I mean the fact is, I think it's really true. Now now actually, the the, the acceleration stuff are best sellers in China because they suffer exactly the same problem, right? Mm. But I, I would really say exactly the the same problems, and even and I was just in Brazil, and you know, I invited by the psychiatrist conference there, association. They they had the the, the congress on um, uh, mental health problems in accelerated crisis uh, times, and they actually claim that it's worse in Brazil than in Europe because they do not have the welfare state or at least the remnants of a welfare state, right? Kind of, um, as, and, 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 and by the way, even in Abidjan, I got an invitation. I was really surprised in the Ivory Coast, right? The French Institute had 14 lectures on resonance, which is, which is Africa, right? <laughs> uh, and I wanted to go there, but it, it, it took too long. I have to speed up. Okay. Um, I, I think it, it, the, the, probably the, the, I mean, the perception of the acceleration as a problem is a kind of middle class problem, but it's a kind of almost globalized middle class problem. Mm. But the two connected problems, burnout, right, alienation and um, and uh, suffering from competition is something that, uh, that, that the underprivileged know very much and very well. And a sense of resonance, I claim, everyone has. I mean, that's really what distinguishes me from Adorno. I think we have this sense of resonance, which is a kind of true sense. And he would say, no, it's just the wrong side of a wrong society. Mm -hmm. But I believe that forms of resonance, ideas of resonance, practices of resonance, you find all over the world and it connects quite interestingly with when we via conceptions in Latin America, 
or with Chinese conceptions. So, so I'm quite hopeful, and I'd like to know more about Africa actually. And I think also um, you're working on the what makes sound into music, and I imagine that the music that interests you is music from all over the world. Absolutely, yeah, because the, the, then it becomes interesting. What, yeah. When when do people perceive sounds as a kind of source of resonance? Yeah. But that's that's another lecture. That's another lecture. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll open up for questions.